Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Vision Seminar. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome today Amlan Carr from the University of Toronto. Uh, Amlan is a PhD student at the University of Toronto, where he is advised by Professor Sanya Fiddler, and he's also a research scientist at NVIDIA Research. He obtained his bachelor degree at IIT Kanpur in 2017, where he worked with Professor Gaurav Sharma on action recognition and with Professor Amit Habab Mujerke. He has interned uh, with the research team at Fusion and also at the University of Toronto, working with Professor Sanya Fiddler and Professor Raquel Ortesson. Uh, Amblan's research is focused in developing methods to collect and generate data efficiently. And with that goal, he has done a wide variety of uh, really exciting works uh, across multiple areas in computer vision and graphics, uh, including uh, data-driven techniques to label objects with multiple like oral words, and also providing tools to improve uh, artists and designers' expressiveness, uh, or also methods to generate uh, like structured data for autonomous driving and medicine. Amblan, it's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, welcome. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for that great introduction. So yeah, my name is Amblan. Uh, I'm a PhD student at U of T, like Xiaomi mentioned. I also work at NVIDIA and Vector Institute, which is also at U of T. And I'll be presenting work uh, from both of these places today. The title of my talk is Learning to Create and Label Data. And, you know, just like every other title, this is only a few bits of information. So I'm obviously overpromising and I'm going to keep, you know, telling you how we simplify things and do simpler things than this very ambitious title as we go through the talk. Cool. So this is sort of the typical computer vision pipeline these days, right? You have some sort of data collection pipeline. Let's say you have an autonomous car. You deploy it, you collect a lot of data. Then you want to label that data and then continuously improve. And obviously, you know, this is also a simplification. Uh, it's, there's much more to do than labeling. You have to pick what data is really important. You have to pick what format of labels you want and all of those other questions. But for our talk today and for our case, we'll just consider that we have a lot of unlabeled data and we somehow want to get labeled data from that, right? So obviously the issue in this pipeline is that humans are involved in the labeling process. When you get a lot of unlabeled data, you typically go ask you know, a big set of humans to go give you labels. And that sort of stops you know, this cycle from flowing very fast because you can train fast, you can deploy fast, hopefully you can collect fast if you have a big enough fleet. And again, that's a separate nuance that we won't probably go into here but labeling is a slow problem. And this is sort of, you know, the main question that I ask in my PhD. Uh, and as sort of, you know, I'm going to talk to you about different ways of speeding this up. And yeah, hopefully you'll enjoy it. Right, so here's the problem. We want to have a lot of raw annotated, uh, we have a lot of raw data and we want to go to annotated data very fast, right? And I will give you solutions in two different ways. One is through interactive labeling. So how do I make the human labeling process fast, right? How can I introduce algorithms in the loop so that humans can do work maybe 2x faster, 3x faster, 4x faster, and eventually, you know, we would want to get to a fully automatic state. The other way I'm going to propose solutions for this is to do simulation. And essentially what that means is that from looking at a lot of unlabeled data, can I go and simulate in a graphics engine scenarios that look like this data? And if I can, then I can render both RGB, which is the images or you know, LIDAR or different kinds of sensors and ground truth. And obviously this is visual ground truth, uh, like boxes or segmentation or depth and so on, right? So we're gonna talk about these two different uh, solution models. So let's first, uh, we're going to go into the interactive labeling side. And this is work that we do at U of T. And I'm going to keep this short. This is going to be sort of a quarter of the talk. And then we will focus on the simulation side more. So for interactive labeling, I really want to talk to you about the Toronto annotation suite. Uh, this is something super exciting that we've been building in our lab. So over you know, the last few years, we've been doing a lot of research into different kinds of interactive annotation algorithms. So we have algorithms for instant segmentation, video instant segmentation, annotating 3D geometry from only 2D media. Uh, we recently submitted a paper for classification and uh, also for data search because 
again, for labeling, it's not only important to do the labels best, but you also want to know what, what things to label better, right? And again, I'm, in this uh, talk, I'm not going to go into these specific uh, algorithms here, and I will, you know, really ask you to go look at this website and we can talk offline after if you're really interested. Instead, what I want to do today is I want to do a quick live demo of the annotation suite itself. And the annotation suite is basically, you know, software that we're building to put all of these algorithms together as one package that we can offer to, you know, people so that you can go and label your data faster and you can then do whatever machine learning that you're interested in, again, much faster, right? So let me go here and just, I want to show you something right here. So just to make sure, can you see the Toronto Annotation Suite web page? Cool. So yeah, this is the Toronto Annotation Suite. And essentially, you know, we like to say we're creating training data sets for AI with AI. Um, and essentially, you know, you go up there, you upload a lot of data. And I guess a lot of you must be super familiar with LabelMe. So LabelMe is a very big inspiration for what we're doing. So again, you go and upload you know, a lot of data, and then you want to annotate it in some particular format. Today, I'm going to show you interactive segmentation algorithms. But then obviously, like I said before, you can do video segmentation. You can do classification. You can even annotate 3D geometry of scenes only on 2D media. So uh, just to jump right into it, you know, there's a lot of tasks here that I have assigned to myself. So I can show you some examples. And here's, let's say, one task. I want to annotate this human right here very fast. And really, what people do right now is they will not have AI. So they'll have, you know, lesser suite of tools that they can use. And they will just go and draw manual polygons across, let's say, this human that I want to annotate. And you can see here, it's painfully slow. And even after finishing it this fast, the quality is quite bad, right? You would not want to train a model on a data that looks like that, right? So how can we really make this fast with AI? And so I'm going to turn this on. And you can see there's like now a suite of tools that we've implemented through many years. This one particular tool here allows me to draw a bounding box across the human. I get a segmentation mask that's obviously not perfect. And that's the whole goal of having an interactive tool. How can you fix issues and then have the interactive model learn what you fixed and then fix other things for you, right? So here, if I fix this line here, you will notice that this edge and this edge got fixed automatically as well. And then, of course, this is also a lot of work. And you, you would imagine that you know, it's very easy to snap to the real boundary from here. And we have a tool for that. So I'm going to press this. And now you can see that I have a very fine boundary across the object that you know, really follows the object very precisely. And you can see there's a mistake here. I can quickly just go erase this, fix it again, and I'm done doing this human, right? So now you might ask me, what was this model trained on? Was this model trained on humans because of which it can do humans really well? And the answer to that is actually we don't train these models specifically for any particular class. And the real trick behind it is to train models that model the boundary better. So traditional segmentation algorithms, what they do is they will model whether this pixel is a part of the human or not. But if you just look at the context around this pixel, it's just a blob of white. Why should it be a part of a human? Why should it not be snow outside my room right now, right? And the obvious reason for why this is a human is because if you look further, it indeed is a part of the human. But this decision requires you to solve a much tougher task than what segmentation really calls for, right? Segmentation really calls for you being able to find boundaries that are really high frequency and are a differentiating factor between this object and this object, right? So here, you know, there's this red, there's this white, there's a clear boundary, and that's a segmentation boundary. And for an interactive task where you want a human to do this, that is enough. And what that allows, what that sort of gives you is it gives you robustness to the kinds of objects you're annotating and it makes your algorithms really fast because you now don't have to have you know, models with very wide field of view that can model context for this pixel by looking at this pixel and saying that, okay, this is all probably one human. 
And therefore you can see when I move these things, the responsiveness is super fast. And actually what's happening here is this model. So when I do this, it's sending a request back to a GPU machine that's sitting somewhere at U of T. It's processing it, it's returning it back, and it's showing me this result here. And you can see that it's still real time. And it still can be real time because you're modeling boundaries and you are making smaller models as a result of that. So let me just show you what I mean by this can go into multiple different objects and I can try to do the cap here. So I'm gonna do this cap and draw this again, press this button, press this button again, erase this, press this, and I'm done with the cap, right? And similarly, I want to show you that this not only generalizes to types of objects that are completely out of training, but it also generalizes to sensors that are out of training. So this model was actually only trained on RGB images. So very real looking images and nothing like these black and white, you know, scans from medical imagery. But here again, I'm just gonna draw a box around this lung over here, if I'm not wrong. Press this button, fix this a little bit, fix this a little bit, do that again, and I'm done with this lung, right? Similarly, you can imagine this scene where there is, you know, very less difference between these objects. And this is sort of the example that you would ask me for, right? You would say, okay, you said that doing boundaries is important. What about situations in which the boundary is really not clear? Like here, the snow and the, you know, dog, I guess, or the fox look super similar. And how would a model work in that case? And again, this is where context is important. And the whole goal of having learned models in the loop is that when you're doing these kinds of examples, you can train the model simultaneously. So you can train the model to continuously improve and to continuously learn from the kinds of images you're doing. So the next time you do something, it's better than what it was today. And actually in our papers, we have shown that, you know, if you do this sort of training in the loop, then you can improve efficiency by up to two X through your annotation. And again, like this was a small example for doing this. And what about clip art images, right? So if I use my box tool over here, it's not going to work as well because this is very fine geometry. So what you could also do and what you could also imagine as an interactive tool is what if I could draw a very quick and rough trace around the object. So I'm not really trying to be very precise. I'm just drawing a rough trace. And then with that rough trace, I can again use algorithms to generate something that looks like this. And obviously this is not perfect. I have to clean up things here, clean up things here, but you get the point, right? So that's sort of a very quick uh, introduction to sort of interactive annotation that I wanted to show you. And I think here, I just wanted to stop for a minute and see if you had any questions, if there's anything particular that you want me to try. And I'm very happy to, you know, ask you to show me examples that you think should break the tool and we can try that together. Uh, I have a question. So in the in the image before the, the clip art that you show, how do you deal with topology changes? Like, you know, the fact that uh, the arm, there was a hole between the arm and, you know, the, okay. yeah, here there is a yes, hole the, that was not. That's a uh, great question. So uh, basically in the tool, how we do it is we ask you to draw another polygon that you would subtract and I can quickly show you an example. So, you know, I do this and it's going to give me something crappy but we will ignore that for now. And I will draw a box around this region. And you can see this is the boundary that we wanted to subtract, right? And there's mistakes, obviously. So I'm gonna clear that, do that, and then subtract the segmentation off. And so how we deal with it on the model side is we'll deal with each of these polygons as individual you know, genus zero shapes. And then you can run processing on each of those. Okay, okay. Cool. Yeah, that's thanks. That was a great question. Are there any other questions? Uh, I have a slightly related, but even though like maybe a general question, um, mm -hmm. you know, let's say you open source this tool or um, when humans are like segmenting these things, um, the segmentations could be noisy, uh, even the ones that are provided by humans. Sure, um, sure. So how do you kind of 
like do you have if you have like more than one segmentation more than one classical segmentation for an image that is provided by the human even after the corrections like do you just dump all of those as plausible segmentation in your training set or do you like do some post processing or stuff like that to like merge them uh, together that's a really good question so the short answer to that is i am working on this right now we are working on this right now in the group we actually recently submitted a paper in the context of classification but in the same question that he said right mm-hmm. even when you're asking people for classification labels they're not going to give you the right label all the time and in fact in some experiments that we did on EMT we found that for you know very fine dog species classification even when we show exemplar images for each species humans could only get like 45% accuracy right now the, now the question is how do you use these 45% accuracy humans to get 95% accuracy labels right right and so we did work right now in classification and there have actually been models in i think 1980 Uh, which is called the ds model that works on this problem called truth inference yep and the next thing i think that i want to work on is how do you extend that to segmentation so the answer from my side would be you know give me half a year maybe and maybe <laughs> i'll be able to answer your question better we should talk about offline but there's something called staple which is uh, apply this for segmentation as well you should check oh, it very out very cool that that's awesome thank you so much yeah i will reach out to you after the talk and yeah. maybe we can Thank you. Is there any other yeah, question? Uh, yes, I have one question. So uh, mm-hmm. you said uh, instead of uh, doing this pixel-wise uh, classification, we are trying to learn these boundaries. Mm-hmm. So uh, mm-hmm. how are you training those? Um, so what is your ground truth for uh, those? And uh, I mean, how their training is different? Right. So they correspond to different methods that we've done, but essentially uh, the main guiding principle is to always work with polygons as you know first class objects instead of a pixel wise mask where you say one or zero for inside or outside so we have different methods that you know take a polygon and deform the polygon such that it can fit an actual boundary instead of saying you know this is inside and this is outside sorry that's you know a very quick answer but that's sort of the main crux of the story so so i uh, just to follow up on that and so how mm-hmm. do you distinguish between uh, boundaries within the image and boundaries outside the image so in person segmentation uh, if you are only looking for the edges then you know the forehead and cap also provide a very high frequency uh, and we'll find a gradient there as well right so how do so, we yeah, that is a great question and the main distinguishing factor here is the interactiveness a human provides you signal when a human says this is the bounding box they probably mean the biggest boundary that fits inside that bounding box now there are many different boundaries that fit right if i drew a box there exist boundaries here and i could very well say this is something that fits inside this box but there exists a bigger one that fits and my belief is that the way we train actually helps us do that so we train with actual object boundaries instead of little part boundaries and we observe empirically that that can then generalize so if i draw you know a box over this eye i'm going to go get this boundary of the eye and if i fix it you know closer to the eye you know that's that's sort of the principle that i believe uh what makes this work and oh yeah that answer the Thanks. question yes sir thank you so much sir um, hi from my side i i probably missed uh few important aspects some alex uh, from europe um maybe one question how would you do few shot updates of your helper model if at all um yeah so you know what we tried in a paper was actually super simple we just said as soon as you get a few examples just fine tune on those few examples and you know some from your memory of previous examples that you've seen so you don't forget so we didn't really try anything very fancy and even then we observed a lot of improvement and this is also a question we're looking into right now because let's say you have 100 oranges in the scene and you i don't want you to draw 100 boxes around each of the oranges right if you do one orange i want to be able to tell you that there are 99 other oranges here and here are their boxes and segmentations So this is a problem that we are actively working on right now and again hopefully in 
half a year, I could have a better answer for you. Cool. Yeah, thanks for the great questions. I'm happy to take maybe another question and then we could move on to the next part. So I have one question. So I think this related to what Antonio was asking. So mm -hmm. if today if you have a, say a vehicle and occluded by a tree or whatever and got split into two parts, right? So do you need to always do subtraction or the model can directly knows that? Um, yeah. Um, so we do need to do subtraction in the way we implement it. So we do have models that can give you multiple polygons, but I think what we realized from actually putting that in a tool and using them was it was much easier to interactively use these models if you know what they can do is very clear to the user that's using them. And you know, they don't throw out surprises. Like when you draw a box, it suddenly gives you two polygons. And then that element of surprise is, I think, something that an interactive tool should not have. It should be very clear. It's not about what the tool can do, but it's about what you can make the tool do. Right? Okay. So therefore, to specifically answer your question, you have to do two boxes, or you have to either subtract the tree. Um, and I think that's a feature than a bug. OK, yeah, makes sense. Thanks. Cool. All right, so maybe I'll shop stairs. Uh, just move this back into the slides, and we can move forward. All right, so obviously, I did not do all of that research work. You know, that would be an insane amount of work. So this is a huge team effort at U of T. And this is just, oops, can I go back? This is just a subset of people that have really worked on this. Um, and this, again, you know, all of our lab in some way works on different aspects of this problem. And you know, without any of them, this would not have happened. Cool. So with that said, let's move ahead to the next part. So I promised to you that I'll talk about interactive labeling and then simulation. So let's move on to the simulation side. So just before that, I want to give a disclaimer that this work that I'm going to show you from now onwards is all done at NVIDIA in our lab at NVIDIA. And in fact, Antonio is, uh, Antonio worked with us on this project. So, so yeah, of course, before simulation, I want to motivate, you know, why a simulation? And this is a video that I really, really enjoy. And so as you can see in this video, we can now render very impressive and very photorealistic environments, right? And you should know that this, this uh, video here is not this good only because of the rendering. There's also extremely good detail in the geometry, extremely good detail in the materials, right? But then you might tell me that we could do things like this 10 years ago. So what has really changed and why is now the time to work on simulation and work on machine learning for simulation? And my answer to you would be, we have now, I think, achieved rendering that looks like this in real time. And because you can do these things now in real time, you can put these in the loop, loop with machine learning models and actually do some training with them, right? Now, the next question that you could ask me is, you know, the, in the previous scene, the artist just manually created the whole scene. So why should we not just get more artists to create synthetic scenes for autonomous driving, for example? And why can't we then just extract data from it? And the short answer for that is that content creation in graphics has lagged way behind the advances that we have made in real-time rendering. So while I can render this scene, you know, less than 30 milliseconds and it would look great, I still don't know how can I even make this car within a real-time speed? Can I just show an image of a car and then get a really good 3D asset of the car? And when I have a lot of assets, how can I even place them onto the scene such that they look like a very realistic, very convincing scene, right? And I think this, therefore, is the right time to ask this question about real-time 3D content creation, right? And like I said, it has many dimensions. How can you improve real-world capture? How do you improve asset generation? And the problem that I'm going to focus on here is if you give me a lot of assets, how can you, ge how can you generate very realistic scenarios, right? And in this talk, I'm going to talk about how this can be used to generate data so that you can use that for learning but it actually goes much beyond that, right? So imagine, you know, there's an artist and they want to design a room, maybe a child's room. And really what is important to the story is that the child must have a bed where, you know, they're going to do some storyline and maybe a table, right? 
But if you then make a room inside a you know, 3D modeling software where you have a bed and a table, it's absolutely not going to look real. And really what the artist spends most of their time on is furnishing the rest of the room and trying to make it look as real and as much like a child's room as possible. And the real problem for me is why can we not do that automatically? Why can we not help the artists really focus on their story and help them with all of these other parts, right? And I think the holy grail for me, which would be you know, absolutely magical, is if we were to be, just be able to do it automatically. I, I give you a table and a bed, you give me back a very realistic room with a table and a bed. And not just one realistic room, but diverse realistic rooms that I can choose from, I can interact with, and I can generate what I really want from it, right? So with that said, you know, that's the big picture. I am absolutely not going to solve even 10% of that problem in this talk. And we're going to talk about how to generate data from this. But this is really, you know, what excites me and drives me to work on this project. Cool. So before, you know, we talked about why we should be doing simulation right now. We talked about why this is the right time to be doing simulation. And obviously the next question to ask is how should we even approach doing simulation, right? So, you know, because I was at NVIDIA, we had access to a lot of people that are, you know, masters at doing this. They have done this for years. And so we went and asked them, you know, how can you do this? And the first answer you got was procedural modeling. So procedural modeling is this field which basically defines procedures or programs that you can recursively call to generate many different things. It can be scenes, it can be even trees. So for trees, for example, a very simple program you can write is you start from a single straight line. You sample a point where a branch breaks. You sample an angle and a length, and you add one. You add a branch, right? And then from that branch, again, you sample a point where the branch breaks, and you add one. And then obviously, there are constraints for how, what angles you can add. But if you imagine running this process recursively, then you can generate a whole tree. Right? And then you can add leaves to it and then starts looking like a beautiful real tree. And similarly, you can do that for actual real scenes as well. And this is something that's been used in gaming and you know, many other uh, real applications much before. So the question is again, how do we bring that to machine learning? And again, I'm not the first person to ask this question. A lot of people have asked it before. And I just think it's, the, it's a great way to actually tackle this problem. So one way of doing procedural models is what's called probabilistic grammars. And I'm just going to explain to you what a probabilistic grammar is. But before that, I want to talk to you about what a scene graph is. So this graph or tree that I'm showing you over here is what a scene graph is. And this is sort of the main structure that we're going to work with. In this scene graph, there are these green nodes that are classes of real objects that are going to be placed in the scene. And each of these objects have some parameters, such as the location, their height, their pose, et cetera. And the cool thing about scene graphs is what you do uh, is you have a coordinate transform that explains what the road looks like, right? So you know the coordinate space of the road. Now, everything else that is on the road lives in the coordinate space of the road, such as the two lanes. Now, everything in the lanes lives in the coordinate space of the lane, such as the sidewalk and the car. And in the sidewalk, the tree and the person lives in the coordinate space of the sidewalk. So if you define a coordinate transform for each of these nodes, then to get to the actual real world coordinates of, the, of one of the nodes, you just traverse the tree through the root. You keep composing these transforms and you can get the actual location of the thing. And why that is important is because tomorrow, if you know, an artist comes in and they move the lane, you don't want the sidewalk and the car and tree and person to stay right there. Right? They should move with the sidewalk. And that's sort of what this uh, kind of scene graph uh, representation helps you to do. And this is very commonly used in many graphics uh, tools right now. Cool. So let's now, I promise you I'll show you an example of scene grammar. So let's look at one. So a scene grammar for me uh, can be written down very simply in this example as roads can generate lanes. And this lanes object can generate recursively arbitrary number of lanes. So this allows you to have roads with one, two, three, four, and up to infinite number of lanes, right? Now on, on each lane, 
you can similarly have a recursive function that generates many cars that you can see in the cars to car cars example. And then you can generate a sidewalk. On the sidewalk, you can again recursively generate as many people as you want. And that gives you a space of scenes that you can generate, right? And this is really cool because ultimately, and maybe I'm going too far ahead here and I should show this first, is first you can sample rules from this scene grammar that I just showed you. So let's say here you sample the first rule that goes from road to lanes. Then you sample the second rule that goes from lanes to a lane and again the lanes object and you end it right there. So the third rule that you sample is the lanes is just going to nothing. So in this scene, you will have a road with one lane. Right on the lane again, you sample one car and you sample one person. Right. And this set of sample rules, I hope that it is very clear to you that it can be converted to a very simple tree based on which rule I have sampled. And I, I want to stop here again and just make sure that this is clear and take any questions. Cool. Okay. Seems like this should be clear. So from these sample rules, I can make this a graph when I know which rule I sampled one at a time, right? So from these, this graph that you see here, this is an incomplete scene graph. And to make it a scene graph, I need to assign little parameters to each of these nodes. So I need to assign where the road is, what the pose looks like, what its height is, what the asset is that defines this road and so on. Similarly for the lane, car, sidewalk, and person. And if I do that for everything, then I get back what I showed you before, which is a scene graph. So what we've sort of done here is we have defined a grammar, much like people do in NLP. Then what we're doing is we're sampling a string from the grammar. So the string uh, is basically, you know, you keep sampling and you end up with a list of symbols that are the terminal symbols that cannot be decomposed more. And this string is a part of what is called the language of the grammar. So all the strings that can be generated from the grammar are, is the language. And we are generating only something from the language of the grammar. And then the goal is that this, or the goal is that you need to find the right subset of strings that defines scenes that are useful to you. And we will talk about what that means later. And the cool other part is that each of these string has a one-to-one -one correspondence to a graph because we know how we generated it. So we have a very structured representation of the scene in the scene graph format, right? And again, I want to stop here and make sure that there are no doubts and I can take any questions. So uh, maybe you mentioned that, but uh, so here the parameters uh, like on the, on the last stage, are they sampled independently for every node or you are actually taking into account the structure? Because even though I guess that you only care what things are in the lane, I guess it matters whether you have something nearby that maybe come from a different branch or something like this. Exactly. That's a great question. So in this particular example, this is just, you know, regardless of how you sample. So you can sample them independently. You can sample them jointly like you should, like you ex explained. And that's sort of what I'm going to talk about later. How do you even sample these parameters correctly? So yeah, thank you so much for sort of setting this up. Um, right, so the final thing that you can do that is very cool in my head is when you do this sampling, you can simultaneously actually go and place these objects in a 3D renderer and you can render the scene out. So not only does each string correspond to a tree, each tree also corresponds to a set of pixels, right? Something that is rendered in a 3D. Uh, and obviously one thing I didn't mention is that there is a camera parameter here for simplicity. But obviously if you define where the camera is in this scene and the parameters of the camera, then you have a particular RGB image that you get out of it. And again, you might say that you know there's lights and all of those other things. For simplicity, we're just ignoring those, but they actually do exist in the scene graph format. Cool. So now, how do we, you know, use this insight? How do we use this data structure to actually do something cool, to actually generate data, like I've been, uh, you know, promising? How do you generate data for machine learning using all of this? And just like Xavi mentioned, the problem is that you, it's very hard to write hand-coded rules 
that give you parameters for this whole graph simultaneously. And ideally, you would have some joint inference method, right? That would generate a set of parameters for every node by looking at every other node, right? It would use the scene graph information and generate parameters simultaneously. And that's exactly what we did in our first paper. And yeah, so the question is, can we learn this you know, placement, these parameters from data itself, right? And that's how we got to this first paper that I'm going to present today, which is medicine. So the broad problem statement is you're given this target data set. In our case, it's Kitty. And the assumption is that it is almost completely unlabeled, right? We don't want you to label the data and then we say, okay, with labeled data, we're giving you more labeled data. We want to go from unlabeled data and get you labeled synthetic data. You have this parametric simulator. In this case, this is the probabilistic grammar. But again, in a general case, it could be any parametric simulator. And the goal is that you want to get this optimized synthetic data set. And we'll talk about what this optimized part means here. Right? So the goals are you want this synthetic data set to be similar in distribution to the target data set. Right? So if this target data set is scenes from Germany, as in Kitty, I want my scenes that I generate to also look like they're scenes from Germany. If they are from India, I would like them to look like they're from India. Right? And there's two parts to it. One is that the assets should look like the target data set. And the other is that the scenario, the placement, should look like the target data set. In this work, we're only going to talk about the placement. We're not going to talk about how can we generate assets that look like a target data set as well, right? And the obvious other goal, because we want to make this for data, is how does this data even affect downstream model performance? If I train something on the synthetic data set that I create, does it improve object detection performance or segmentic segmentation performance or so on, right? So we want to somehow optimize for that as well, right? And obviously the challenges in here is that you're learning through the simulator, which uses rendering, and that is not differentiable. So, you know, neural nets are gonna have issues and you're learning with a separate model in the loop. There's something that is learning how to generate the data. And there's something that's eating up this data and doing some perception task. And you want to improve the performance of this thing that's eating up the data and doing some perception task, right? So obviously that's going to be a challenge and we're going to, you know, sort of try to do something about it, right? So essentially, if you again look at the big picture, you have some way of parameterizing how to generate data. Then you want to learn the right parameter distributions so that you, the data that you generate is the data that you want, the data that you need. And this is super similar in my head to how people do neural architecture search, where you, know, you parameterize architectures so you define a search space for architectures. You learn the right parameter distributions. So you learn the right set of architectures that you can find. And then that's neural architecture search. So I, for myself, I like you know, calling this problem neural data search. And it just makes me excited about thinking about this problem in this way. Cool. So that said, let's look at now some model uh, and how we can actually design a learning algorithm for it. So I'm going to first describe the forward pass. So we talked about the probabilistic grammar already. And this is basically the set of rules that define how you can generate scenes, right? From this probabilistic grammar, you can randomly sample an initial scene graph. And to specifically answer Chavi's question before, in this case, we're going to independently sample the parameters for every single load. So obviously there's going to be a lot of issues in the scene graph. There's probably cars sitting right on top of cars. There's humans on top of humans and probably in configurations that are absolutely nothing like real, right? And then what we want to do is we want to train this model that basically rearranges the scene. So it changes the parameters for every node such that this scene graph that we sample randomly now in its parameters starts looking like a real scene. So you'll notice that here, only the parameters change from red to green and the structure of the scene itself stays the same. So it's still two cars in the scene, two people in the scene, you know, one road with however many lanes that was randomly sampled. And all I'm trying to do is rearrange the scene such that it now looks very realistic. Now, how do I know it looks very realistic? But I'm going to render it, right? So I'm going to pass it to this renderer. In our case, this was the Unreal Engine. Again, 
can be an arbitrary render. It gives you some sensor output. In this case, it was, again, RGB images. And then finally, you have this downstream model that's maybe doing, oops, object detection X. So it's going to take a bit and just going to go back. So you have this downstream model, you know, that's going to do some kind of perception task and you want to optimize for that, right? So now let's talk about how you can operationalize this idea of generating data that is similar in target distribution to the real data and somehow optimizes for this, right? So we do this with two different loss functions. One is the distribution matching objective. So this generate button that you have on the left is basically what I showed you before. It's the forward pass. So you generate a scene graph randomly, you pass it through a model, which rearranges the scene, then you render it, you generate a lot of images, right? That's what this generate line is doing. And now you have a batch of synthetic images that you've generated, and you can take a batch of your unlabeled real data. And then we want to say, do these come from the same distribution, right? And again, this is an ill-defined question. So how we're going to define it better is we're going to say, do these come from the same distribution under some feature extractor? So we're going to extract whatever features. They are deep neural net features and so not very interpretable, but they probably have information for what kind of objects live in there, what kind of scene this looks like. And we want to say in this feature space, are these the same distribution or not, right? And then we use this metric called the maximum mean discrepancy which is what they call a two sample test. So if you have two samples from two distributions and you want to test whether these are the same distribution or not. And maximum mean discrepancy is one way of computing that. And the best part about it is that it's completely differentiable. So you can backdrop to the whole thing, right? So we use the MMD, maximum mean discrepancy in this case to do our distribution matching loss function. In the next part is we want to somehow optimize for the downstream task and as a disclaimer, this is a part that you know we did this way, but honestly, I'm not very happy about it. And I would love it if you know somebody would tell me how can I improve this, how can I do this better. But what we did is basically the you know simplest thing that you could think of. We generate a lot of data, we train a model right there, and obviously, you know, there are tricks. How do you make this fast? How do you train this such that you can, you know, don't spend two hours training your perception model and then get one gradient step back, right? But then you train this model, you evaluate it on a little bit of labeled real data, which is like this validation set, let's say you have access to, you get some performance and you use that as a reward function. And then you estimate gradients for this performance with respect to your generator. And then you again run optimization, right? So this is more like a reinforcement learning problem. And we basically use the reinforced gradient estimator here. And that can be made better 100% as well. Right. So just to go back to the big picture again, this is what we had. Our goal is to optimize the parameters in this graph neural network, right? So these are the parameters that we're optimizing. Here we said there are two different loss functions, one which maximizes similarity to the target data and one which tries to maximize the performance of the downstream model. But then there's an issue that this renderer is non-differentiable. How do you backprop for that, right? So the way we did it in this paper is we did numerical gradients for every single node and every single attribute in the scene graph. Now that sounds horrible if you think about it, just to start out, but computationally, it's actually not that bad if you have a real-time renderer. And it turns out that if you have a scene with about 40 objects, each object has, let's say, three to four parameters, then individually for every parameter, if you do a X plus delta, you re-render it, compute the difference in the images, and then you have you know, the difference in the images divided by difference in the parameter you changed as the gradient, then you can do it very decently fast. And we actually, with a six FPS renderer, we could train this whole model in about one to two days, which I would say in this day and age of you know, one month training is pretty reasonable, right? So again, this again is sort of a very simple way of doing gradient descent through this. And I'm really hoping that in the future, we will be able to have differentiable scene renders. And there's actually a new paper on archive called Neural Scene Graphs that basically makes you know, each of these little nodes in a scene graph a nerf. And then you can render the nerf from arbitrary 
uh, you know, viewpoints. And I'm hoping that you know, progress in that direction can go and plug in into this vendor, and then we can train much better as compared to doing what we did here. Cool. So I want to stop here again and just see if there are any questions. Hi, Amlan. Hey. Yeah, great talk so far. Uh, I was you. just thinking about the renderer here. Uh, mm -hmm. I think there's a DIBR renderer from EFT, right? So uh, could that also be used in place of the uh, uh, Unreal Engine renderer? That's, that that's a great question. So the short answer to that would be right now, the differentiable renderers that we really have actually work on one object or multiple objects with one level of occlusion. But we really don't have a very complete differentiable scene renderer yet. And I believe that this is an open question. And I would love, you know, if somebody gave me pointers to papers and work that have sort of solved this. But to the best of my knowledge, this is still an open question to differentially render a whole scene with multiple levels of occlusions. That's it. Thanks. Cool. It looks like we have nine minutes left. So maybe I'm not even going to talk about the second paper today, but I think this is probably better to go slow and go through one thing as well. All right. So given all of that, I want to quickly show you some results. So the target domain that we worked on was in 3D driving scenes, like I told you before. So we go from some kitty images, and the goal is we want to generate these kinds of scenes. And these are actually output scenes generated from the model. And as a metric, we want to measure how good does a trained model on this simulated data perform on some downstream task, right? And for baselines, we basically compare with just the grammar. And this itself was a paper at ICRA 2019 called Structured Domain Randomization. Right. So on the Kitty data set, we basically did object detection only for the car class. And this is mostly because in our renderer, we had you know, many different car assets, and we were limited by assets in other different uh, classes, which is why if you train a model on those, it overfits very fast to their appearance. Right? So therefore, these results are only car AP for detection. And you can see that if you train a model, it gives you a decent boost. And if you do image to image translation on top, you still get a bigger boost, and there remains a difference between the things that you get from the grammar versus the things that you get from our model. And what this tells me is that there are two gaps between synthetic data and real data. One, obviously, is how they look. And that is something that a lot of people have worked on. And so, you know, image image translation is one way in which people sort of try to do something about it. So you take this synthetic looking scene on the left, and then you want to get this real looking scene on the right. And I'm not sure if you can see my cursor. Uh, but if there is still a performance difference when you train with our model, then it means that not only is there a difference in how they look, but there's also a difference in how synthetic scenes are arranged, right? And if you do a better arrangement of the scene, you can actually get better performance on a downstream task, right? So it's the structure of the scene also matters, and that is something that should be learned, in my opinion. Um, let me show you some qualitative results. So here are some random real images from Kitty. These are some examples from the probabilistic grabber. Again, these are independently sampled parameters for node. So you can see that they look odd. There are cars in very weird positions. There are cars on top of cars. There are trees on top of trees and so on. And these are the rearrangements of these particular scenes with our train model. So here again, you can see that all the arrangements look more realistic. There are you know, cars in their appropriate lanes. The cars are pointing towards the road. They're spaced properly. There are humans on the road. There are bikes on the road. Even the houses have moved. And overall, I would believe that this is more realistic than others. And later, you know, in our second paper, we also showed that if you measure metrics for distribution similarity, this actually improves those metrics as well. And here are some examples of running object detection when you train on data that is generated on the right by just the probabilistic grammar. And on the left, if you train on data generated by medicine. And you can see that there are a lot of false positives that you get if you train on like very randomized data. 
And if you learn to generate the right set of data, then your detections also start looking much better. And again, this is just scratching the surface and there's a lot more to unpack in here, but you know, we can probably talk about it after uh, or with questions as well. Cool, so I think I wanted to talk about MetaSim2, uh, which is a paper from ECCB as well. But what I'm instead going to do, since we have five minutes left, is give you a very quick overview of what it does in the big picture and show you some cool results. So essentially, the issue with doing this is that we have learned to rearrange scenes, but we're still missing what I call the structural posterior of a real scene. So here, you know, these kinds of scenes, when they're sampled, they're sampled by some prior on the rules, right? So when I sample these scenes, they can have maybe an average of five cars and maybe an average of 10 people. But this average of five cars and 10 people does not hold across different real data sets. In many different real data sets, you might have an average of one car or five people or three lanes or two lanes or different, basically different sets of nodes in the scene. And then the question is, how, do, how can you automatically even learn that? And in medicine too, what we essentially do is there exists a model here that from the rules learns to sample the rules one by one, such that it generates a learned structure of the scene graph as well, instead of a randomly sampled scene graph according to some arbitrary prior that we generate, right? And I will not go into the architectural details or the training details, and you know, feel free to ask me questions after, and I'm very happy to answer. But I just wanted to show some very quick results. So here, what I'm showing is a quantitative evaluation of the number of cars in the scene that is generated from, in orange, the prior. And you can see that it does not align with the kitty data set very well. And in green, the learned model that aligns with the actual ground truth much better. But still, you can see that the orange prior is a pretty good prior. And this is sort of the prior we use in medicine. And therefore, you know, things worked out well when you transfer it to the real data set. And that prior requires some manual design. We have to actually go in, look at statistics of the kitty data set, and do some designing there. But what if you had a much simpler prior? In this case, you know, the prior just says every lane either has zero or one cars. And because there, are, there can be many different lanes, therefore the distribution on the number of cars looks like this. Right? There's just one or two, three, and some of four, but none of the rest. And we find that even if we're training unsupervised, this model can still learn to mimic the actual distribution of the kitty data set pretty well. And honestly, I, I found this result to be super exciting. And again, you know, if I show you performance, it does improve over doing nothing. And it also improves in PID and FID, which are used in generative modeling more. But honestly, I don't believe they're the right ways of evaluating synthetic data generation because there's a clear visual gap between these two. And finally, you know, this is another slide that really excites me, is the whole fact that you can now, you have, what you have ended up with is sort of an infinite data generator. And of course it's limited, but you can still sample a lot of scenes from it and get a lot of data out of it. And hopefully that is, you know, very helpful for downstream tasks. And yeah, that's sort of all I had to say about this. I also did want to talk about an extension to medical imaging for this work, but I think I'm just going to completely skip that for now. So yeah, thank you so much for hearing me out for this hour. Thanks a lot, Amlan, for the super exciting and very clear talk. Thank you. Uh, I guess we have to for Sorry, Chavi, I think I lost you there. I didn't hear you. Oh, sorry. Uh, I was just saying thank you. And if people, we have, I guess we have time for like three or so questions. So I don't know if you mentioned it, but uh, what are the features that you're using when you are training like the, mm -hmm. the first MetaSIM project? That's a great question. So in this case, we just use an off-the-shelf ImageNet uh, ResNet 50 if I remember correctly. So it, you would then obviously think about does using a better feature 
improve uh, running? And the short answer is yes. But then it also means that you're using some domain information, which we wanted to avoid. Um, the other question is, how do you know what these features even have, what information these features have? So to sort of find that out, what we did was we overfit on a particular seed. And then the goal would be that, okay, if you're overfitting on one real seed, you would either reconstruct it perfectly if your features are perfect or not. And what we found that it reconstructs the cars and the, you know, the people really well, but the houses and trees, not so much. So that sort of gives you an insight into what information these features hold as well. So definitely there's room for improvement in what kind of features you use. Yes, I think. And uh, I guess you've had like not that much time to describe, but uh, when you're learning the, the grammar, uh, mm -hmm. is there something else to learn than the number of uh, ad Like, Sorry, uh, you got cut off a little bit, but my understanding of the question is that you're asking, is there something to, something else to learn than a number of kinds of objects, the number of symbols in the seed? And again, the short answer is no. The, uh, what you're really trying to learn is the distribution of uh, you know, different kinds of objects in the seed. And obviously there's a little bit more to that in that it's also a distribution of number of objects as a tree. So it's not just the number of cars, but also number of cars in this lane versus in that lane, which is also something that can be different in different kinds of field scenes. I see, thank you. Are there any more questions? Okay, um, 